on the day of the Feast of St. Ignatius. And there's a few considerations here on this feast day here in, uh, in Georgia, the south of Atlanta. We have Father and Son of the Ghost of Men. St. Ignatius is one of the great saints of the last 500 years, and one of the saints that marked the seven ages of the church, the seventh age being the age of the judgment, of the final judgment, of the day of judgment. And we are now in the fifth age of the church. And we say two great events took place in the beginning of the fifth age of the church in the 1500s, was 500 years ago, was Our Lady of Guadalupe appearing in Mexico. Our Lady of Guadalupe appearing in Mexico showed us what is a kind of a prophecy of what's going to happen at the end of the fifth age. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ said the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, they are the same. They are the same. And so that the history of the church is, is a very... Uh, um, it is in control of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the 500 years ago, the Mexicans were doing human sacrifices. They were completely given over to Satan. And in fact, so much so that when the missionaries came and they preached the faith to the Mexican people, they were not impressed. One of the elements that did not impress them was the Mass. They were unimpressed by the Mass. Because the priest taught them the truth about the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass which is in the Mass, there is the body and blood and the soul and divinity of Jesus Christ, and He is crucified in an unbloody manner during this holy sacrifice for our sins, and we consume and eat God-made man. And they were not impressed because they were very much aware of their pagan priests who used to take human beings. In one great ceremony shortly before Cortez came, the king of the, of the, the Aztecs, the father of Montezuma II, he took... 30,000 warriors and brought them to one altar in Mexico and up one of the pyramids and in three days they killed all 30,000 on the same altar, cut out all 30,000 hearts, held them in the air and then a priest had to prior to consuming each one. They said a priest could, could cut out a human heart in 11 seconds. And when he grew very tired, it took maybe 20 seconds to cut out a heart, they would be, and another priest would take his shift, take his place so that the full 30,000 would be killed and their bodies thrown down the altar and uh, down, the, down the side of the, uh, the pyramid and the dogs would lick up their blood and eat the remains. And then and the, and the human hearts would be taken down to the lower part of the temple to be consumed by the priests. But 30,000 in three days was too much for many people. The blood filled the entirety of the altar of the stone of the pyramids. And these Aztec pyramids are so filled with so much blood 500 years ago and 600 years ago that even now, after 500 years of rain and, and weather, the blood can still be seen in the stone. And so when the priests, when the, when the Aztecs heard about the sacrifice and a man being eaten, they wanted to see blood like they were familiar with, and they were not impressed. They were not impressed. So they were not converted by the mass. But then also the Aztecs, when they saw the missionaries, the missionaries were not wicked priests, they were good priests, but there were no great saints amongst them. There was no St. Francis Xavier, there was no St. Ignatius, there was no great saint amongst them. They were not wicked men, but they were average priests. And they were going there and trying to convert the people and teaching the faith, and they were not impressed by the priests. They were not impressed by the Mass, and there were very few of them converting. Meanwhile, the group that came with them, which is associated with the Catholic faith, this group was... The, 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 the Spanish leaders, and they were very corrupt. And they were turning the Indians into slaves, and they were, and they were being quite wicked with them, and they were not being good. Bishop Zumarraga, the Bishop of Mexico City, saw the great trouble because they had arrived only in 1521, and now it's a 1519, and now it's, and now it's only a few years later, and they have not established their stronghold, and few people are converting to the faith, and he saw the great danger of the faith being lost in Mexico. So he prayed to Our Lady for a sign. And he asked Castilian roses to be sent to him. And he prayed <clears throat> that she somehow remedy the situation. And there came the miraculous apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And this miraculous apparition came on December the 12th, 1531. And just like that, 10 million Mexicans converted to the Catholic faith in a matter of a very few years. And what is noted about this great conversion 500 years ago, it was brought about only by the Blessed Virgin Mary and only by a miracle. That's how it happened. And this is a sign or a type 
of what's going to happen at the end of the fifth age of the church. 500 years later, which is now our time, when in, in, in 2031, 10 years from now, we will be 500 years after the great miracle of Our Lady Guadalupe, and we know that the age of this fifth age of the church, of the age of the corruption, is about a 500 year old age, about a 500 year age. Mm -hmm. The same age happened in the Old Testament, when about 500 years, 600 years, six years before Christ, Nebuchadnezzar came and brought an end to the sacrifice in the temple. And, in, and, and then a few years later in 596, he destroyed the temple, 596 BC. And then he took all the holy vessels of the temple and took the vessels of the old sacrifice and he brought them into Babylon and the Jews were then captured for 70 years. During these 70 years of captivity, the young boy Daniel was brought into captivity and the old man Daniel was there at the very end of the captivity to witness the victory of the Jews over the Babylonians. And there was a 70 year captivity <clears throat> and this marked the beginning of the fifth age of the Old Testament, the age of the corruption of the Jews. And from that period until Christ came, the Jews stopped going and worshiping false gods. Before that, they used to go and worship false gods. They used to go out and worship the false gods and join false religions and worship Baal and other false gods. But what happened after this age is that they changed their view about Christ why was this? Because Daniel gave the great prophecy that in 70 weeks of years, Christ would come. And 70 weeks of years is 490 years. And that there would, in the middle of the 70th week, 486 and a half years, the victim and the sacrifice would fail from the time the temple would be rebuilt. So now the date was put, 486 years between the time the temple begins to be rebuilt and the coming of the Messiah and his sacrifice. Therefore, Satan changed his tactics. Before this, he was trying to get the Jews to worship false gods and leave the true religion completely. But in this fifth age, he rather decided to change the way the Jews thought within their own religion. And this is what's happened in the last 500 years in our Catholic Church. Since the 1500s, since the, since the Pope decided to destroy the, the, the original Basilica of St. Peter's, built by Constantine, and rebuild it with a new basilica, which we now is 500 years old, and most of us call a very beautiful church. But that church was built in order to show the Catholic Church is entering into a new age in which it will make itself more like into the Roman period and the Greek period. And that we are going to recognize the wonder of the Romans before Christ and the Greeks before Christ. And that so that and so that and they still wanted to keep their faith in the beginning of Constantine the Great. And it was a symbolic beginning of the 500 years of the decline of our Catholic Church. During this period of the great decline of the Church, we find Catholics beginning to change their view. Dogma used to be the most important thing about being Catholic. I must be a Catholic. A Catholic is one who saves whole. And this is the age of the decline of the Church, which is called by the Fathers of the Church the Fifth Age, the age of the fishes and the birds. That is the age in which the fishes were created by God on the fifth day and birds created by God on the fifth day. This is the age of the walking away from God. We are in the end of that age now, an age of approximately 500 years, and we are now at the end of that 500 years. How will this age come to an end? It will come to an end by a miraculous victory like Our Lady of Guadalupe, a miraculous victory of Mary, and she said this would happen. But in that 1500s, God rose up St. Ignatius of Loyola. How do we fight during these 500 years? We are now at the time when the church is in retreat. We are in the time when the church is being defeated, our citadels are being knocked down, our laws are being removed from every... Remember, every law of the Western culture is a law that comes from the Catholic Church, whether it be the speed limit laws, the laws that govern how we rule in society, the laws of how to make law and how to rule law, all rule people in, in an ordered fashion, all these laws come from the Catholic Church. Plus the laws that are the moral laws, that we live according to the commandments. They all come from the Catholic Church. Well, 500 years ago, they took the Catholic Church bit by bit out of the government, out of the cities, out of the state, and now they're taking Jesus Christ out of the church itself. And this collapse has been going on for these 500 years. And St. Ignatius says, how do we fight against it? It began with this soldier who realized 
We need strong soldiers and who are ready to fight the strongest when the church appears to be losing. It is easy to join the army when you're on the winning side. Now, of course, we know we're on the winning side. But we are not in the winning phase of the battle. We're in the phase of retreat. We are losing one divine law, one natural law, one good gift of the church. All right, after another, after another, after another, after another, as we travel down these 500 years. And so the church, our Lord Jesus Christ said, I will not abandon you. I will not leave you orphans. So he doesn't leave us orphans in this 500-year period. It happened in the Old Testament. We had to go through this period, and the great prophets were no longer there. There were a few minor prophets of that time, such as Malachi, St. Malachi, Malachi of the Old Testament. And, but the great prophets were all gone and dead. Daniel was the last of them, and Ezekiel, and, and they, they were contemporary with Daniel. And Jeremiah, also contemporary with Daniel. They were the last three great prophets. And then only a few minor prophets remained, and Israel became smaller and smaller and smaller until it was conquered by the Romans. And then Jesus Christ came with the victory of the New Testament. So it will be in the New Testament. We are now on the stage of the shrinking of the church, the stage of the collapsing of the church, the stage of the retreat of the church. And St. Ignatius is the great warrior of telling us how to fight in this time. How do we fight? First of all, because we are so weak in battle, he had to teach us how to fight. His ancestors were born knowing how to fight. They were born knowing what it means to be Catholic. They were born knowing what it means to pray. Born knowing what it means to, be, knowing what it means to belong to the army of God. Well, we're in an age we don't know that there is an army. We don't know that there should be an army. We don't even know that there is a conflict. And when we find out there's a conflict, we believe there are two conflicts or three or four conflicts. There's a spiritual conflict, which is going on inside my soul, which I'm trying to pray my rosaries better, and trying to stay out of sin. And then there's a conflict in my family, a conflict in the government, and a conflict in society. And I can't worry about the conflict of society because I've got my own conflict. I can't worry about the conflict of the family because I've got my own conflict. And I, have to, and I have to fight so many different battles. So St. Ignatius reminds me two spirits. And there is only one war. It is the war of the kingdom of Satan. That Satan has a kingdom, and Christ has a kingdom, and there is no third kingdom. Now this would be something a thousand years ago you'd have to tell nobody. Because they weren't that stupid yet. Just like nowadays we have to tell people, this is boy, and that is girl, and they're not the same. And we have to say that, that the, the, the milk comes from cows, things like that. We have things here in an age of idiots. So then they just teach us there are only two spirits when every idiot on the planet should know that. But he has to teach us that. And then he has to tell us there are only two spirits, the spirit of God, which moves us to do good things, and moves us away from God. Because very often you do good things. Like it's very good to work and support your family. It's very good to eat uh, hamburgers. But it's not good to work and support your family and eat hamburgers in church on Sunday. That's not good. Because it is not the time for eating hamburgers or placing any hamburgers in the church. It's called a sacrilege. It is not the time of work. It is a time of prayer and worship on the Sunday. It's a violation of the Sunday. So there are many things that are good, which the devil uses to bring us away from God. This is the good of loving your wife, the good of loving your husband, the good of, of going to work, the good of being a responsible man. So therefore, there are two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the spirit of God which moves us towards God. And the kingdom of hell and the kingdom of Satan and the spirit of Satan which moves us away from God to another place called hell. And he uses good things to do that. Not only evil things. Not just sins. But the devil uses good things to bring us away from God. One example of this in our time the devil created the motu proprio mass, not God. 
The devil created the indol of Quator Anos of John Paul II. He created the indult of Benedict the Sixteenth, and he created the indult of Pope Francis. Satan is responsible for all three of those indults, and Satan used the mass as a tool to bring souls away from God. Just like 300 years, 400, 500 years ago, 600 years ago, the priests of the church went before St. Joan of Arc with the Blessed Sacrament, and they said, oh, Joan, you cannot go to Mass, but if you tell one lie, if you say that God, the Holy St. Michael did not appear to you, we're going to let you go to Mass. She said, I can't do that. Then you're despising the Mass. You're against the Mass. You're a devil. And then they brought her Holy Communion. Joan, you can receive our Lord Jesus Christ. And they had the host right there in the room next to her. All you have to do is sign a paper that you are a liar. You just have to sign a paper that you recant from telling lies and believing that voices from heaven spoke to you when they were not voices from heaven. She would not sign the paper. And they said, you have denied Christ. And a priest walked away with the Blessed Sacrament, and she did not receive it. And she was not allowed to attend the Mass. The Mass was used as a tool to get her to deny God 600 years ago. So likewise, the Mass is being used as a tool since John Paul II to deny God in our times. What is that new Mass doing, or rather the old Mass with the approval of the new, the old Mass with the approval of Vatican II, well, that is the spirit of Satan. What is it being doing? Taking the good thing to bring us to a bad thing. St. Ignatius gave us the answer 500 years ago when he said, remember, there are only two spirits. And I'm going to give you 14 rules of how these spirits operate in the first week of the exercise of St. Ignatius, which he also had to give us. And I'm going to give you eight rules in the second week and explain to you the rules of how God and how Satan work that we might be able to see the wiles of the devil in order to avoid them and see the ways of Christ and his good angel in order to follow them. For we are soldiers, we are not kings. This is something that St. Ignatius had to tell us because everybody today believes that they're a king. Everyone today believes they are God. How did we get to Vatican II in 1962 to 65, which is the, can be defined quite simply as the council that replaced the worship of God with the worship of man. And not man in general, but me, myself, and I. How can that make sense to anyone that has one billionth of a brain? It can only make sense if we've traveled through 500 years of lives and we have followed the spirit of Satan down that period, which the majority of souls have done in this age, which is also called the age of the great apostasy. St. Ignatius gave us the answer to the apostasy. He gave us the answer to how to see the battle already now. He even has a list of rules of this is how you pray. Praying is to lift the mind and heart to God. Anyone can pray. You, don't, you should not have to go to school how to pray. Just like when a child is born, you don't send them to the school, son, more good if you're forgetting being. Nutrition is part of being good. We'll teach him that these foods are good and those foods are bad, but we shouldn't have to teach him eating is important. We shouldn't have to teach him that air is good for you and, and carbon dioxide is bad for you. But in our age, we have to teach these things. The St. Ignatius, recognizing our weakness, said, here's how you pray. You can begin prayer this way. And pray you to prayer. Let us through the gospel. And we all travel through the gospel the last 2,000 years. But St. Ignatius says, now do you realize this gospel is not just what the Protestants call a good book. It's not just something to know and understand, but the gospel is necessary as an intimate part of your everyday life. And so he shows us the crucifixion, and he shows us all the time parts of the life of Christ, and how they apply to my life. And that I must follow Jesus Christ when I get up in the morning with my morning offering. I must follow Jesus Christ through the day. I must follow him at work. I must make him the guide of all my decisions and choices that I make. That's what I have to do. St. Ignatius taught us these things. 
And then he formed the company of Jesus. Every single religious order is a company. Unit of an army. They are a fighting unit. But we're too stupid. We don't know that. So therefore, he had to call his order, we're the fighting unit. Oh, I didn't know that the religious orders are fighting units. They are. Hence, I'm forming a company of Jesus, which we now call the Society of Jesus. And this is the company of Jesus. Did you know the Benedictines? They are all companies of Jesus. And one of them is called the Company of Jesus. And he had to give it that name because we're too stupid. Just like nowadays we don't know that men and girls are different. We don't know there shouldn't be homosexual marriage. We don't know that the mass without faith is wrong. Our ancestors knew that. The Orthodox have the mass. They've had it for the last thousand years since they separated from the church. And they have not changed their mass. It's the same beautiful mass that we have. The problem is the Orthodox are separated from the Pope. They are schismatic. And the Orthodox are also heretics. They don't believe all the teachings that came down from Jesus Christ. And therefore, we don't go to their mass. So likewise, we tell souls, don't go to the Motobrogro masses. Don't go to the Indult masses because they are not of God. They are not with the true faith. You wouldn't have to tell that to our ancestors. They would simply stay away because they would see that's not the true faith. They are accepting error. I won't go. But we have to tell them these things now. And St. Ignatius taught us how to say these things to modern man. Also, St. Ignatius received his strength and inspiration from the Blessed Virgin Mary. And every single saint received inspiration from the Blessed Virgin Mary. But in order that it might be clear that there's nothing that comes without Mary, he spent three years in a cave in Manresa when he was deciding what to do. What am I going to do? I want to be the greatest of soldiers. And I thought being a soldier equals chopping someone's head off. Because Ignatius was a modern man. He was also stupid. And so he had to spend three years with the Blessed Virgin Mary, three years in a cave, three years as a hermit to meditate on what am I supposed to do? What is a soldier? A soldier is one who fights for Christ and against the devil. And how do I do that in every aspect of my life? And the Blessed Virgin Mary inspired him. And she was the one who was a true foundress of the company of Jesus. And then he found that company. And he also realized that our faith must be practical. It's got to be put into practice. We can't just have the faith in our minds. And Jesuits are famous for being practical. In the very beginning of the 1500s, in the, in the early 1600s, the heresy and error, evil heresy and error of Galileo came in the picture. And the change of the world's change from science. Science is going to take over religion. And we're going to have a new priest who's going to be the scientist. A new priest that will govern the world. And Pope Urban VI said, this is the gravest evil of approaching, the attacking the church in our times. And he enlisted the Jesuits. You must know astronomy. You must know the sciences in order that you might condemn and defeat the enemies of the church who are using the sciences to destroy the church. They were faithful in this work in the beginning. And he also said, bring Christ to souls. And when the Jesuits went to South America, they created the greatest government that has ever been created in the history of the world. Even pagans recognize that the reductions created by the Jesuits are the most wonderful government and the most wonderful society ever known on this earth. The Jesuits came and they said, here's how you plant flowers. Here's how you build a house. And by the way, here's how you shoot a cannon when the bad guys are coming. And here's how you fight an army. And here's how you sing beautiful music. And here's how you serve mass. And here's how you make an entire culture that is 100% Jesus Christ. 100% justice. 100% virtue. And then here's how you deal with those who are not practicing the faith and not living according to virtue. You teach them with equity, but when necessary, you must also punish them. And they taught them who suppressed the Jesuits. Another hallmark of our age. There's one man responsible for destroying the work of the Jesuits, the original Jesuits who don't exist anymore. There is now a society called the Company of Jesus. There was a society called the Jesuits, but they were not founded by St. Ignatius. That order was suppressed in 1741, I believe it was, 1742, one of those years. It was the Pope that said, the Jesuits are doing too much good. 
The, the Jesuits are building Christianity in the New World. They're making a Catholic culture in Asia. They are translating, they're converting souls in China and throughout the world. They are changing the world for Christ, and therefore the Pope said, you're suppressed. The Pope shut down the Jesuits. And hence we see the Jesuits are the great warriors of our age who fought to defend the holy faith, who brought the faith to the people of our age, and the devil saw them as too dangerous, and therefore he infiltrated the Holy Roman Catholic Church, Satan did, and he convinced the Holy Father to suppress the Jesuits. They were suppressed for about 50 years, and then they were brought back to life by the same name, but a different order. And so they are not the same. And the new Jesuits, guess what happened to them? The new Jesuits were the Jesuits who prepared for Vatican II. The new Jesuits were the Jesuits who put modern science over religion, who put modern economy and modern ways of doing things over the Catholic faith, who deceived, infiltrated, and destroyed the Catholic Church. The primary enemies of the Catholic Church in the last 200 years are called the Jesuits. The primary defenders are the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are, in their beginning, as founded by St. Ignatius, spiritual fathers of our society of St. Pius X. We must take the faith and not only preach it, believe it, and follow it, but we have to put it into practice. And we have to carry it to souls who don't seem to want that faith. We have to bring it to them. And we show them the way in which the faith can be lived in our age and show that the only answer to every problem of 2021 is Jesus Christ, His Holy Church, and show how that gospel applies practically to our age. To show how there is nothing truly new under the sun, that Solomon was right, and we would do it in the Jesuit fashion, very practical and very theological. And St. Ignatius was the, one of the greatest leaders of the last 500 years, brought up by our Lord Jesus Christ to teach us how the Blessed Virgin Mary, to teach us how to fight and how to act in this age of the decline of the church. And notice that there is no, no, uh, no thought of defeat. St. Ignatius, the Jesuits also were the great defenders of the papacy. They were true defenders of the papacy, and the Jesuits we saw the church being attacked, the papacy being diminished, and they defended it. And we also defend the papacy in the New Society of St. Pius X, founded by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. We defend the true papacy of Pope Francis, who was a wicked pope, but he still represents our Lord Jesus Christ. He's still the successor of St. Peter, and he's still the answer to the crisis of the church because he must obey heaven. And as we are the true defenders of the papacy in our times. And those that are going along with the modernism are not defenders of the papacy, but, enter, in, but enemies of the papacy. As Archbishop Lefebvre said in true Jesuit fashion and the true spirit of St. Ignatius, St. Archbishop Lefebvre, who will one day be canonized a saint, said in 1974 in his declaration, the only way to be truly faithful to the Holy Father, Pope Paul VI in 1974, Pope Francis in 2021, the only way to be truly faithful to the Holy Father is to resist and combat this modernism, this evil of the, of the ecumenism of Vatican II in every way possible. This is how we remain faithful. And so it is now true in 2021 as it was true in 1974. And it remains true, usque ad mortem, usque ad seculum siculi, all the way until the ending of the world. So let's stay firm in our holy faith and ask the grace to fight like St. Ignatius in our times against the enemies of God and the enemies of the church, which are one and the same enemies, and the enemies of the world. There's only two spirits, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, and the spirit of Satan. And the spirit of Satan runs our entire world. We are against that one spirit, not against those many spirits. Against that one spirit. And we follow the one spirit of Christ. Not many spirits of Christ. There are not many religions. There's only one. And we follow the one spirit of Christ against the enemy, the one enemy of all of us, and that is Satan and his kingdom. And has remained faithful in the fight all the way until death. And whenever the Blessed Virgin wants, she will have her sudden victory, as she did 500 years ago in Mexico, so she will do in the near future for the entire world. And we're closer to that. And bless you all. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.